I've kind of mashed together this company that's built the principal core of it is hand making, hand grinding, hand fabrication, and that's all complemented with a with a, a layer of technology and CNC. And that's the opposite of what most cut knife companies are. So it's a unique place in the market are, are the way we make. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to episode number 46 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to another episode where we're going to talk about knife stuff and hear an interview with a uh, custom knife maker. We'll get to that in just a second. But uh, new knife for you this week, Bob, or, or not? Or, yeah, well, or sort of a new knife. Well, yeah, sort of a new knife. This week, um, recently, my brother was here visiting, and uh, I had gotten the Bark River Knives made blackjack version of the uh, Randall Model 1. Okay, it's a beautiful sort of traditional World War II era fighting knife. And uh, they come with different shaped handles. This was a uh, a purchase that was, uh, this was a knife center purchase. They sent me an email, hey, look at these knives. We found them in the warehouse, and we think... You know, we think they're the last ones. And so wanting one badly, wanting a Randall badly, but definitely not really into buying one right now. Uh, I jumped on the blackjack with the, uh, with a handle that, that widens out towards the end. And that, that'll come up in a second. And, uh, it's got beautiful ivory micarta handles and, uh, it's a great, great blade. So it shows up and, uh, I'm inspecting it and everything is perfect. And then I slide it in this gorgeous sheath. And then I can't get the retention strap around the thick butt of this handle. And, and it occurs to me that they, they ship this all with the same sheath, but, but with different handles because, uh, the other version of this has the stacked leather handles in a commando grip. It's what they call it. So it swells out and then towards the butt, it comes back in like a waistline. So the sheaths are built to accommodate that thin waistline near the butt of the knife. So I was really bummed because I love the knife and I love the sheath. It just, they just don't go together. Well, lo and behold, my brother came to visit and he does a lot of leather stuff. I told him to bring his little case of, uh, his travel case of leather tools and see what we could do. And we were able to move, we, he was able to move the retention strap from the top of the sheath down towards the, uh, the cross guard where it fits and it doesn't have an opportunity to slide out. So, uh, just a, a word of warning: if you're if you're gonna get this uh, CPM three V version blackjack uh, Randall Model One, make sure that you're ready to move that sheath down, move that uh, retention strap down. I love the way you said "we" and then quickly corrected to say "he." <laughs> yes, well, I was perhaps the brains of the operation. Oh, <laughs> that's that's not true. I just let's said, get your brother on the podcast yeah, exactly. and we'll talk about that one time. <laughs> I said fix. Please fix. <laughs> I'll, I'll fix your dinner or something like that. Exactly. I'll let you sleep in my house. So that was uh, not a new knife, but a modification, if you will. So something there. But you're also getting cus uh, custom a little bit more to the um, the EXT01, I think, is oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. the the axe or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's a tomahawk. I th I think the uh, I think a tomahawk is is technically like a fighting axe, but not meant to split wood. This sucker is. Uh, so this is the Hogue made. Elishowitz designed uh, EX dash T01. It's a uh, it's their tomahawk, and uh, you should look it up if you're listening and you're, you're interested uh, in what I'm talking about. Just check it out. Look it up on Hogue.com and check this thing out. It is kind of like half knife, half uh, tomahawk, half axe. It's mm -hmm. got this uh, beautiful uh, sort of four inch uh, cutting blade. I mean, the blade is sharp. It's like paper mm -hmm. cutting, hair shaving sharp. And then it's got a handle that feels almost like a sword handle. Down at the end, it has a a bird's beak that really keeps your your hand in, and it's light and thin. And if you practice with a knife or a stick, you know um, this uh, this tomahawk fits right in with whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. And mm -hmm. you can trap with it, and you can thrust with it, and you can slash with it. It's right. pretty cool. I'm gonna do a, a video sometime this week on it for the collection selection, but I'll I'll do a little demo of how it can be used too. Right. Okay. Well, you can look for that uh, video on the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at the knifejunkie.com knife slash YouTube. 
And uh, speaking of Elishowitz, Alan uh, was a guest on last week's podcast, episode number 45. So if you haven't caught that yet, go to theknifejunkie.com slash 45, and you can hear that interview and uh, hear a little bit more about, uh, about that as well. Um, another great knife maker coming up on the show today. Uh, who do we have coming up that you're going to be talking to, Bob? Today I'm speaking with Greg Medford of Medford Knives. Um, he needs little uh, introduction. He's got a a lot of uh, videos on YouTube, and and his knives are just um, well at this point they're ubiquitous in the knife world. Everyone knows them. Not everyone has them, unfortunately. I wish I had one. Don't have one yet, but uh, I see a Praetorian in, in my future. I gotta say. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Greg's a very interesting guy. He's got a, an incredible background of not only uh, service to the country in the Marine Corps, but also just very interesting hobbies like fighter jet flying and and other things. He'll he'll talk a about hobby. <laughs> yeah, very very interesting guy, and 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 just sort of a force. You know, he's he's got a real um, he's got a real uh, uh, momentum behind him, and the way he took on making knives you'll you'll see it was very Mm -hmm. very straightforward very interesting right uh seems like a great guy yeah greg greg medford of medford knives all right we'll hear from greg in just a minute but i do want to remind you that uh, the knife junkie podcast is brought to you in part by quickbooks self-employed it's your year-round tax solution it's definitely a must-have for contractors freelancers anybody who is self-employed and if you want to save money at the same time go to the knife junkie.com slash qb30 Knife Junkies will get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, 30 days for free. Just for listening, go to thenifejunkie.com slash QB30. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Call the Knife Junkie at 724-466-4487 with your questions or comments. All right, welcome back. We're here with Greg Medford of Medford Knives. Greg, thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Uh, Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, so you're known uh, for your handmade, very sturdy, very stout folders and uh, and uh, custom-made fixed blades. Tell me how you got into knives. I know you have a military background, but you're also a flyer, right? Yeah, I I basically, uh, you know, at the time I had uh, I had several art, martial arts schools over the year over the years, and uh, when the economy crashed in '08, it hit Phoenix particularly badly. And I was kind of at this spot where I was i was kind of like living like a Hawaiian. I, I, I kind of worked a few hours a day. I mostly got to chill out with my wife and hang out with my kids. And I was happy just kind of chugging along like that. Didn't have any big aspirations. And then the economy tanked, hit Phoenix particularly badly. And I, you know, at that point, everyone's like, I don't need to do martial arts. So uh, all of a sudden I went from making a hundred grand a year, and, you know, kind of chill little life to making no money at all. And I still had all my bills and I still had the business and all of that. It just wasn't generating any revenue. And I'd run a successful school for you know almost 20 years. What were you teaching? Uh, I taught Kempo and uh, mm-hmm. Jiu Jitsu. And you know, I had multiple, multiple black belts in a bunch of different styles. But when that all started to slow down, and I mean really slow down, uh, I knew it was a good time for me to get out. I was kind of feeling like I'd been doing martial arts since the 70s. And it was it was, a, it was time to transition. So I've been flying for, oh, I don't know. I've been flying since I got out of the Marine Corps. So about 91, I'd been flying aircraft and I'd been flying in air shows as a stunt pilot. And I had restored a bunch of airplanes and built engines and, you know, built old uh, former military aircraft. And, and uh, so I had had all this, uh, I, you know, I had a background of handmaking. You know, my grandfather was a leather worker and a tin worker. So I'd been around leather work. And I did my first leather relief shaping and patterning, you know, maybe when I was six. So I'd always just been around handcrafted stuff. My dad was a master plumber. So I had been, you know, from an early age, I had learned how to hustle and work with my dad. And, you know, it sounds kind of weird, but I learned how to dig a ditch. You know, if a man knows how to dig a ditch, Yep. And he's yep. smart. That's a kind of unstoppable human, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had learned how to work hard with my dad and work smart. You know, plumbing was a very technical trade and, and then uh, got into metallurgy as I was working on aircraft. I was doing a lot of work on Russian aircraft, which have a mix of steel, huh. aluminum, and titanium. You know, most Western aircraft don't have that mix of metals. They're, you know, there's almost no steel anywhere. Everything is aluminum or an exotic alloy. The Russians like mixing steel. And so I had gotten to uh, build and rebuild aircraft and, and do a lot of reverse engineering. And so the, the movie The Inglorious Bastards comes on. And I'm 
a huge Quentin Tarantino fan. I'm a big film kinophile. And uh, I watch the film and I see uh, Brad Pitt. He's got that Bowie knife in the film. Yeah. And so I said, I want one of those. So I started looking around for a Bowie knife. And lo and behold, it doesn't exist. It's a custom knife. So I looked to have one made. And a bunch of my students pulled together, bought me a really nice custom Bowie knife. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But I was like, hey, I can make one of these. And so I thought about getting in the knife business. And, it, and you know, it was like I got the karate schools are, are, are waning. The economy's crashing. My friends are doing well. are all in manufacturing. And I just said, hey, I want to be in manufacturing. And I put together this huge spreadsheet and I rated everything on how much I thought people cared if it was American made and kind of an intersection of something I wouldn't mind doing every day plus something I'm comfortable and familiar with, cutlery, metallurgy, manufacturing, and then all just kind of crashed together. And that was the mashup that came out was knife making. I drew 20 knives um, one day, invited over a bunch of friends for beer and laid out the drawings on the pool table and said, guys, tell me what you think. And, you know, everyone picked something different. I said, okay, I got a knack for this. I'm going to make knives. I rented a building the next day. I bought a grinder the day after that. I flew to Missouri a week later to accept the grinder and learn how to use it. I spent two days learning how to grind with a guy named uh, Tom McGinnis, and uh, the rest just kind of happened pretty organically. The first year was me, the mad scientist. I was teaching karate and flying airplanes, and my financial life was winding down, and I was just figuring out how to, you know, pay rent and make knives. And then at the end, by the end of the first year, I had made hundreds of knives. I'd sold them all. I had paid my rent, my mortgage, paid off all my equipment. I was kind of going, wow, oh, this is more than just Greg retreating from the world. I, I could actually build a company. I spent a couple months with a good friend of, uh, friend of mine. She helped me write a business plan, and uh, that's how it took off, man. I made a plan, and I followed the plan and been flexible about adapting it along the way, and here I am. So, uh, so 2008, you started. What's your what's your manufacturing like now? What are your capabilities over at Medford Knives? Well, I actually started in 2010. So everything crashed in 2008. It took a couple of years for like mm. all the planets to align, so to speak. So we've got about 30 people on staff. We can make about 1,000 units a month, uh, anywhere between 900 and 1,200. I've got about 20, 23 people, 22, 23 people in production. You know, we're kind of a really interesting mix. I look at manufacturing from, well, I looked at a lot of different possibilities. And, you know, I, I kind of figured I was bright enough to pull this off. I'm a reasonably educated guy that picks stuff up quickly. But I didn't understand manufacturing. I didn't understand how sophisticated it was to do it well. But I've arrived at this place where I'm kind of, I'm very, I, I'm not a troglodyte, but I'm kind of leery of technology mm -hmm. because, Technology can make you irrelevant so quickly if that's your thing. I, I've kind of mashed together this company that's built the principal core of it is hand making, hand grinding, hand fabrication, and that's all complemented with a with a, a layer of technology and CNC. And that's the opposite of what most knife companies are. So it's a unique place in the market are, are the way we make. Yeah, unpack that for a second. Uh, let the listeners know how that that model is different or the opposite from what's uh, primarily well, out there. Well, so primarily what's out there is production grinding. So you stamp out or cut out thousands and thousands of a thing, and then you scrap a couple, 50 or 100 of them, setting up a production grinder, and then you grind 10,000 of them all exactly the same way. And the grinding is not very artful. It's just kind of production grinding, trying to keep the cost down. So what's happened is the knife industry was hijacked by the race to the bottom that the Chinese came in at. And everyone knows how that battle goes. Everyone races as cheap as they can, and they end up being the high end of cheap. And then, and then, and then you have all of the Chinese junk that showed up with stolen technology, concepts, designs, and approach. And now, as enough makers have taken the chicken shit approach of making it in Asia because they can't figure out how to make it, they've spooled up the Asians into making quite good knives. So now you've got good knives being made in Asia. You've got the manufacturing core of knives have been 
routed here in America, and whoever's left is making mostly mid, what I would call mid-tier, low to mid-tier production style knives. They're trying to make them the way they make them the same way the Chinese do. So we don't do anything like that. We basically water jet out. We, you know, grind by eye uh, by eye hand in the measuring small batches of knives on a grinder. We see and see the handle parts and the blades are made by hand. They're ground by hand, no jigs, no fixtures, freehand ground by eye. They have a masterful level of symmetry and, and uh, a lovely kind of organic uniqueness to every one. The lay person puts them next to each other and they can't see the difference. And then you start measuring with a micrometer and they're all subtly different. Right. And then every part is goes into a hand assembly area where it's assembled with sacrificial new parts. Everything's put together with diamond lapping compound. And then those surfaces are all lapped and moved until they begin to mate to each other perfectly. And now you have this metal on metal, large surface area mating of parts. And what that gets you is it gets you a knife that translates between the edge and the handle very much like a fixed blade in a very old fashioned kind of organic way. I could get into the, you know, physics of energy transference in blades and mechanics of tools and all of that. Uh, that's a whole different question. But, you know, we have this handmade component, which gives us this beautiful style of grind, which gives a uniqueness to every blade. And the blade is the corner, you know, it's the, it's the pillar, it's the engine of a knife, right? And and the handle, people don't think like, oh, my handle is artfully, you know, this, that, or the other. Well, the art, art knife guys do, but knife users, you know, they're really focused on, does the blade fit in my, does the uh, handle fit nicely in my hand, and does the blade execute well? And then subtly, there's this quiet communication that goes on between the et razor edge of a blade and the feedback that goes into the handle. It's an ancient communication. And uh, the less mush, squish, wiggle, or play there is mm -hmm. in that mechanism, the better the communication is. Listening to you speak, obviously, this is something uh, you've spent a lot of time working on and, and uh, flowing with. What was it like handing over control over making these knives to other people as you began to grow? Uh, what did you put those <laughs> knife makers through to, to make sure they were making a Medford knife? Well, you know, the thing that's crazy about it is that, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the secret of your success? And, and, a, lot, and a lot of times these interviews like this, they're really trying to get at, you know, what's this guy's kind of got a little American dream going on. What's the secret? Mm -hmm. And the, the secret is it's a combination of a lot of things, but I think I have a very utilitarian style and design of a uh, 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 design ethos to how I make stuff. I think that speaks to tool users, but because I'm a tool user, I have this requirement of how a knife should feel that I like. And so I built a whole company around this feel and this quality of feel and this quality of feedback and this usability of the tool and this practicality. So it has this kind of craftsman ethos that we saw from the Stickley family uh, during the craftsman mm -hmm. period in furniture making. It's got this very utilitarian beauty, beauty and simplicity. I tell people all the time, you know, instead of putting bearings on the inside of my heavy use knives for ease of assembly and manufacturing, we put – so what I see go on, I get compared to these guys who make these beautiful knives on the outside that have bearings on the inside. And – you know, I can usually, you know, I can break those knives. And guys will say, oh, Medford, he's talking out his ass. He can't break those. I can mostly break those knives. And I've done it with really expensive knives on purpose and on accident. I've broken a lot of knives on purpose, just testing stuff. Because I'm like, inqu inquiry minds want to know. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the way I make my knives on the inside is time consuming and it's artful and it's craftsman. So uh, instead of dressing up the outside of a knife and glossing it up, I've really put the time to the inside of the knife, the performance of the knife, and that's a different thing. So the outside's got a utilitarianness to it mm -hmm. that maybe a new race car does. You know, a new uh, race yes. car up, you know, race cars are pretty from like a hundred feet away, and you get close, and they're not pretty like we're used to from a from a Porsche. They're 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 rough because they're working tools. Inside, they're beautiful. So I have that kind of approach. Well, outside they have uh, definitely a refined um, ruggedness for sure. 
Yeah, yeah. You, you keep mentioning tools, and, and obviously these are hardcore tools, but you're one of the few makers out there, and I really appreciate that, who's unabashed about uh, the role of knives as a weapon. I, I remember seeing, like, when you first... Um, came into to my view years ago i remember seeing a youtube video where you said i want i want all of my knives to be able to punch through a helmet i thought that, that's cool that's a cool criteria because you don't hear too many people uh people mince words when it comes to knives you don't seem to do that you know i just feel like human beings and i'm not the first guy to say this but human beings see the world through a a lot of filters fundamentally, okay? But you could break it down into two camps of people. There are people who view the world and their, their, their conception of filtering the world and judging the world and ruling the world and their society is from the column of safety. Uh, and then there's another column of people, especially here in America, where the, their way they judge the world and view the world is through the eyes of liberty. And I'm from this camp, and it has fewer people in it, the Liberty Camp. And for us, safety is not a given. We expect it from no one. We're more rugged individualists. Uh, my argument is we are absolutely not the lemmings of America, and I think we are more American. Now, people don't like to say it. I am more American. I have earned it, and I am, than many of my countrymen who have not earned it. Because I'm sorry, expecting safety is not earning it. That's entitlement. So I just view the world a different way. I don't expect safety. I expect to rely on myself. You know, if you expect the police to protect you from someone, for instance, burgling your home, you're a lemming and your family will be taken advantage of. If you expect, because police are reactive. They're, they're not stopping crime for the most part. And I don't hold them, you know, I don't expect that of them. So I have this perspective in my entire worldview. So the way I think about a knife is I'm a, I, and I'm not a dude running around with like a first aid kit in my vehicle, like all ready for Armageddon with a go bag and a zombie kit and all this bullshit. I, I, I don't have any of that. Uh, you know, I know I have just enough guns to take whatever I need if Armageddon actually happened. You know, I had an IT guy to say to me, lovely guy helping me out today said, hey, there's two perspectives. You can have your server in the building or you can have it out in, in the cloud. And I said, well, I think I'd rather have, you know, some cloud service. They're way more secure than me with my little tower down at my. And he said, well, you know, if, you know, if shit really hits the fan, you don't have your information unless it's on your server in your building. And I said, if shit really hits the fan and servers aren't working, I'm going to be doing business with a gun. So what do I care about my server? You know what I mean? So I just have this different mentality. I mostly follow the rules. I bend them a little bit here and there. I, I pay my taxes. I'm, you know, I'm part of the social fabric, but I think about knives as a first response tool to get what you need done all the time. And I don't think about it as like a weapon, like, oh, if I need it for a knife fight, you know, bullshit. I think about it as cutting seat belts and breaking glass and having it if you need it. And you know, sometimes just being a little more confident. Hmm. People undervalue confidence. Uh, intellectually, viscerally, women love confidence because it makes them feel secure in the presence of confidence. In business, confidence is huge. In a boardroom, you know, I walk into a boardroom and I usually, I'm the fucking boss in the boardroom because I'm confident. I know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, a man of my own destiny and everybody around is mostly working for somebody. And I end up half the time just like saying, okay, well, like, here's what we're going to do. And I kind of take charge. And, and my point is, I've got this kind of self-reliant streak in me that I can't get around. And 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 having a knife, it's a I think it's a talisman of confidence and self-reliance. And it's more important than anything. You know, I've made seventy thousand knives, and I think two of them have cut up seatbelts, or four of them maybe. I, you know, I've, I've had one border patrol guy shot in a in a uh, drug interdiction thing up on the border with Canada. And, and was shot in a knife of mine. If the bullet hit the knife and splattered into his face and didn't kill him. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool. Like for me, you know, I love that kind of stuff. But, you know, like that's happened maybe, maybe I have 15 really unique knife stories, which is less than one tenth of one percent. It's almost nothing. So the truth is, knives are opening boxes and letters and they're making guys feel good about themselves and a tiny bit more confident to think. 
I don't know if that I don't I don't want to be- belittle it or demean it, but I'd like to call it like I see it, you know. Yeah, that that seems pretty apt. Uh, there there are lots of things that give uh, people that feeling. Uh, are there yeah. other kind of things that you are interested in manufacturing along those lines that you know would kind of bring out that spirit? Well, for sure. All right, so so let me just talk about the big three for dudes, okay? The big three for dudes is watches, suits and ties, maybe shoes, maybe briefcase, maybe pen. You know, like in the business world, the big boys, business card, pen, suit, tie, those all those little things kind of add up because you're in these high stakes, big numbers world, let's say New York finance. The weapon of New York finance is, you know, what kind of Mount Blanc pen do you have poking out of your pocket? What tie are you wearing? Those aren't silly. They're only silly if you're from Phoenix or Missouri. In New York finance, those are the weapons of the trade, right? Every bit as much as a a Navy SEAL wearing the right tactical body armor and coming in with an MP5 or whatever they're carrying. So there is some, there are a couple more things that I'm really into making. And as my company is maturing and I'm getting some bandwidth and as buildings come up for sale, I'm kind of snagging property to put, put my next thing into. I've got, you know, three other significant companies that I'm trying to spool up, but I'm in the process of right now. I'm in development on them right now. And those are going to launch and I'll be kind of a arm's distance executive in those companies, but they're my brain children, you know? So I think um, you have an entrepreneurial spirit and, and you could be making any kind of widget and you would probably be doing well. It sounds like, uh, it sounds like, you know, business is definitely something that you have a grasp on. Do you think that knife making or, or let me ask you this way. At what level do you think knife making is good business if you're not an entrepreneur? Uh, okay. It's the end of a long day. Tell me that. Ask me that question again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. That was obliquely stated. I, I, I guess I just mean, you know, is 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 knife making a good business to go into? You happen to uh, sound like you have. Uh, sounds like you have your business stuff together. But for just someone who's talented at making knives, is that a good business? No, it's not a great business. Um, it's too small of an industry. It's a contracting market there isn't it doesn't have a lot of growth potential in my opinion uh, the main market has been spoken for and it's been cheapened down it's not a core lifestyle product it's got a lot of things going against it what i like about it is it's old technology it's not going to be supplanted very easily and if it's a billion dollar industry which it's approximately a billion in the us it's a slow decline and all i've got to do is grow within that billion dollars and i can i can do well but as a, you know, would I recommend my son get into it? Not necessarily. You know, you asked me a question a few minutes ago and I didn't answer it. I'm really comfortable having other people dive into the making of my product. As I designed it and learned how to do it, I didn't have like a love for grinding knives or a love for smelling titanium on my skin. Those were all a means to an end. I wanted to make a cool product that I really loved in my hand. That was what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be a grinder. I ground a lot of knives and I only stopped sharpening knives. I mean, here I am 10 years in. I stopped sharpening knives a month ago. And occasionally, (laughs) if the right two people are sick, you could walk in the factory and see me out sharpening knives because it's one of the high skill sets. Congratulations, man. (laughs) I, I actually love seeing people grow and I love seeing people rise up and I love training guys and I love seeing people get their craftsmanship wings and, uh, and I love seeing, you know, men and women fall into a craft where they become an expert. And so that to me is really exciting. And the end result is they make knives now in my shop that are better than I make them. <laughs> and and guys who say, oh, I make knives better than, you know, bullshit. You, you can't grind 20 knives at the beginning of each month and be as good as the guy who ground 20 knives yesterday. <laughs> Impossible. So uh, I've smashed together Henry Ford's production model and Steve Jobs business model, high tech and old tech into this old durable hard good business of knife making. And that's kind of how I'm, how I roll. So during the period of time where you were earning your bones and, and grinding knife after knife after knife, kind of as a means to an end, did you uh, at any point f- fall in love with the process from an artistic uh, perspective? Did, did, were you surprised by um, an attachment or anything that to the process? 
You know, I've heard there from psychologists, there are two kinds of people in the world, folks who carry their baggage and folks who leave baggage behind and move on in life. And I'm a leave baggage behind guy. As soon as I'm done with something, I'm done with it and I move right on to the next thing. So for me, I was never a knife collector. I'm a tool user. So for me, I like making good tools. And each time I finish one, I go, oh, I could do the next one better. And, and then I move on. You have to have ambition, intelligence, hardworking spirit, a huge stomach for risk and tolerance of risk, and a little bit of arrogance to make this all work. You know, I always ask people, you know, what's your ambition? Do you have a risk tolerance? How hard are you willing to work? How comfortable are you are with and and, and then uh, and, and do you think you can do it better than somebody else? And people are all like humble about it. I go, hey, listen, you got the wrong attitude. This, this self-employment thing's going to gobble you up. You got to feel like you can kind of do it better than everybody. It's like fighter pilots. You never ask a fighter pilot. If you ever talk to a fighter pilot, and they say, yeah, you know, every fighter pilot's the best fighter pilot in the room. Or why the hell would you do it? You feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm good enough. That means half the guys I run into could probably kill me. So, you know, fuck it. I'll be a mediocre fighter pilot. Nobody thinks like that. Right. So it's the same thing with this. Entrepreneur. You know, like, you know, for me anyways, I'm like, look, if I'm going to do this, I don't want to do what Benchmade does. Benchmade already does that. And they do it well. I want to do something different. I want to make what I like. And all I ever cared about was cool. Like, is this cool? Mm-hmm. Do I dig it? And it sounds kind of weird. Like maybe it's a low bar. Does it feel cool in my hand? Does it look cool in my pocket? Does it work in a cool way? Is this cool or is this dorky? Like, I kind of keep it simple. Well, obviously, built into your cool is functionality. You're not you're not just uh, looking at it, is it mall ninja cool? You're obviously, part of your cool is utilitarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if, if it's cool looking and doesn't work, it's a poser and that's phony. <laughs> So I, I see, I mean, and I'm telling you, man, I'll tell you this. this is, here's my critique on the knife business right now. There are a ton of young guys designing knives in SolidWorks who are really good drawing digitally, who knife companies are putting their stuff into production that haven't actually felt it in their hands. And I pick these up. They're sophisticated. They have wonderful parts and wonderful machining and great work done to them. And they're awful knives. And I just shake my head. I go, you know, if this company hired me to come in, I could actually make their company cool. Because right now, they make these artsy, these really intricate looking knives with all this stuff and all this work. And their knives feel like shit in the hand. And I just go, why why would you make these knives? (laughs) It cracks me up. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, when when you think of the idea of art knife, it's it's kind of funny if you're looking at the knife as a tool. It's like what what's an art hammer or an it's like a, art, yeah, it's like art a, wrench? An art gun. I'm gonna make an art gun. What? Yeah, yeah. So I remember also once I don't mean to dig up old stuff, but you mentioned once that you weren't fond of flippers, and now you got some pretty damn sweet flippers. What, what's up with that? Well, you know, there's times in our lives when we're acting younger and there's times in our lives when we're acting older and one of the traits of the old is you become intransigent inflexible non-pliant uh you you don't think forward and i've had periods where maybe somebody's made a false claim against me and i've had to defend myself in court i'm in a bad mood for a couple of months I, I'm usually a pretty upbeat guy because you got to be upbeat or being a self-employed dude will grind your soul up. And and so what happened with the flipper thing was the flipper concept in and of itself, I'm fine with. Now, I talk combatives for years. I'm pretty good in the fight. A gun, knife, barehanded, a couple of guys. I'm pretty confident and capable. And, you know, I love doing that kind of stuff. What I never found to be important was having your knife out really, really fast. (laughs) I found that most people who were in a hurry getting their knife out, when I trained in combatants for years, the number one thing they did is drop their knife or cut themselves with it. (laughs) So I was a big fan when I taught combatants of getting your knife out slowly, mindfully, and seeing a fight happen before you need your knife out. If you need your knife out in a hurry, it's, it's too late. Plus, there was never a knife fight at the OK Corral. I mean, there just isn't a big quick drawing knife world. (laughs) So, so after I started carrying knives more, I kind of fell in love with flippers and I like them and I think they're really cool. 
Here's what I like about them. No extra mechanism required to have a knife that almost deploys like an automatic. Right. No, nothing. It, it just, boom, boom, open. One-handed, scrape. Here's why I got a little negative on them. The the narrow group of, I call them, I, yeah, you know, I don't speak very nicely about them, but the guys who are really nuanced collectors of flippers who like to kind of, let me, let me pull my flipper out that I'm carrying in my pocket. Oh, actually, it's not a flipper. It's an auto. So they, they want to see them. They want to hang the blade and see it kind of pendulum naturally, like mm-hmm. it's the zero resistance blade. That's the, that's the dumbest. Those guys, that's the gayest, dumb thing you could ask of a knife. That's the dumbest thing ever. It's like, I, I want a hammer on my gun that just goes off real easy. <laughs> what? It's the dumbest thing ever. But the guys are very, very finicky, especially the L.A. and New York collector crowd that takes their knife and slides it into a foam pocket, and that's where their knife sits. Uh, you know, a foam pocket in a in a, in a carrying Pelican. case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I was really very – I had a very pejorative, negative feeling and connotation around flippers because of those guys getting on with my new handmade knives that required some break-in. They were really critical of me, and I was a little – you know, I was coming to terms with social media. Mm-hmm. I was coming to terms with the fact that half of the internet is a giant sphincter. And uh, I was, you know, and I just wasn't real smooth with it at the time. So uh, you, you mentioned uh, you, the idea of opening up a knife mindfully is more yeah. important. And, and I think that that still translates and is still important. Um, you know, there's, there is a, uh, something to be said for fidgeting. If you're going to fidget, fidget with a knife. I mean, that's, that's what I say. But, uh, just, uh, I think of the Praetorian and, and the way it's that beautiful sort of shallow fuller on the side that you use to open the blade. That, yeah. you know, until, uh, until one gets used to that, it is a more deliberate action. It is less fidgety. And yeah. so that's, that seems to be, uh, an, a direct illustration of what you're talking about. Well, you know, it, uh, oh man, this is such, so this, this interview is going to come off. I'm going to be like, cause I'm pretty raw and straightforward. And I don't filter myself to come off. Well, I don't really give a shit. Fidgeting to me is a sign of weakness. So I'm not into fidgeting. Mm-hmm. I'm not into people making excuses before they do something like, Oh, I haven't done this in forever. So forgive me if I suck. I'm like, Hey man, shut, you know, I don't, I don't know how much I need to, I'm like, Hey, I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Do you know who your dad is? I, I, I like to pause the guy. Well, wait a minute. So people chewing on their fingernails or fidgeting around, it's weakness. So I, I have no room for that and I don't accommodate it. I think everything a man does should be purposeful. Yeah, I, and I, so I just don't have time for frivolity. I was just sitting down reading Ron Cherno's book on Washington. And he's one of my favorite heroes and uh, a real person, a real hero worthy of every bit of it. And I'm reading about his childhood right now and his upbringing and his thoughts on fidgeting. And they're very similar uh-huh. to mine. And I think it's fascinating. But I'm, I'm, I'm just not a fidgeter. So I like stuff to be intentional, I like people to be purposeful. When I was teaching guys how to fly, I never wanted – I was always nervous about guys when I started training them who put their hands up before thinking onto an instrument panel. And I would say, hey, 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 hold on a second. Stop touching stuff. You know, look, know what you want, and put your hand purposefully. Like if I say, hey, man, you're, uh, you don't have your, uh, uh, your altimeter is not set to the correct barometric pressure. And they start putting their hands up on shit. I go, what are you doing? There's one button you need to touch right now. You see where it is? Now put your hand on it. Don't touch anything else. You can. You know, this is an airplane. Don't don't mess with anything else. Yeah. <laughs> so the stakes I'm, are I'm, high. <laughs> yeah, the, the stakes are a little bit higher there. But um, I have this economy of motion, and I taught this in combatants when I was teaching fighting and self defense as well. Don't do anything extra. Stop. Quiet everything down. Very little is re- actually required if you do the right thing first. I just wanted to get into one other thing, and that's uh, politics in the knife world. It seems like a pretty decent. Uh, decent community. So what are your impressions of the knife world these days? Well, hey, listen, you know, the the Generation Z is coming and uh, they're a skinny jean wearing, hip shoe wearing, minimalist crowd because they don't have much money yet. They're getting into the community and I don't disparage them. I kind of get where they're coming from. You know, my mom's generation, the uh, 
baby boomers, they were collecting shit. And I think it was because of that World War II rationing that happened, spooked everybody. Like, hey, is this whole world going to work? Are we going to be out of butter forever? And so they became like quasi hoarders. You know, girls got silver. You know, they wanted silverware and they had dowry chests and all this weird shit. And this new generation's not like that. They don't want 8,000 foot McMansions and they don't want six cars. And it seems like everything they pick, they want it to be a reflection of how savvy they are. You know, like, these are my sneakers. Here's why I wear them. Look how unique they are. It reflects on me being a mindful human. So I'm trying to adapt and be relevant to those guys uh, because they're coming and they are our new customer. And if we embrace them from the Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone approach of knife fighting, you know, we're going to lose them. These skinny jean kids wearing these $400 Nike shoes, they're not getting in knife fights. What what does that look like in terms of knives? You said you want to accommodate this generation. Uh, how do you do that in making knives? Well, Smaller yeah, so knives? I make this big, I make this big, heavy tactical folder, right? No, you know, I do it by uh, hip designs. And I do it with a uh, non, I mean, I'm not a square company. I'm outspoken. Mm -hmm. I try to touch on their patriotism because they're patriotic. They just don't know it yet. And, and they're more patriotic. The more you ask them questions away from their friends, the more you isolate hipsters from a hipster crowd with the perfect beard oil, the more they, they share the same ideologies of 50 year old ex Marine who's been to the middle East. You, You start, if you query them away from the silos of left and right politics, the more alike we are than, and it doesn't matter if they're black, white, or anything, the more alike we are than dissimilar we are. So, you know, the way I see the politics is I, I, I think what they like is authenticity. So my judgment is what they don't like is a square middle-aged guy faking like he's cool. I, I think they don't like that at all. So if you're not cool, you probably ought to just shut up and make knives. If you are a little cool, I think it's a good marketing compliment to a cool product, if that makes sense, to an audience that's looking for cool stuff. You know, they like, these guys aren't adventuring in Alaska and they're shopping from Filson. You know, (laughs) they're, uh, they're, they're buying the best adventure gear the world's ever made because they like the pattern and how it feels, not because you're going to Alaska to go kill a bear. Right, right. I think uh, you, you nailed it before. You said it's a talisman of confidence, you know. Tool, yes, but it's a little bit yeah. more important than a tool. It, I think talisman is, uh, is, uh, is exactly the right term. It, there, there's something else. There, there's an interesting niche here, and, and it's a little spot that I'm trying to steer into. So I'm just going to tell you because I don't have much to hide. In a, in a world where for the last 50 years, masculinity has been kind of a, had a negative connotation. And in a world where young men are trying to find their place somewhere between carrying around the baby bag and the baby Bjorn and carrying all the stuff like a daddy Sherpa somewhere between there and being a lumberjack who drinks too much beer. They're trying to find this masculine ideal. You know, look, I'm trying to find it too. You know, how do I be a better man, more sensitive man, all these things. How do I make it all work so that I fit in the people around me in an elegant, graceful way. And I think young guys are trying to do that also. And, and in doing that, it is, our culture has been so effeminized, kind of in a swing with the feminists starting in the 1960s. I think it's over feminized right now. And I think one of the things, you know, a watch speaks a little bit to masculinity, but a knife speaks a lot to masculinity. And that may be a thing that's going on culturally with young males is saying, you know, hey, look, man, I've got these skinny jeans on. My girl wears skinny jeans like Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm wearing this shirt because it's cool on the show. I shop at this Ikea place, and I'm not really supposed to care about what color my table is, but I'm trying to be supportive of my girl, and she expects this of me, so I'm trying to be a good guy. So basically, I've had my nuts chopped off. Why don't I throw a knife in my pocket, and uh, it's my little kind of rankle to the world. Like, I'm still a man. It's still here, and if you need me, I'm still here. So when the flood happens, give me a call and I'll cut you out of your car and save your life. You know, maybe there's a little bit of that just lurking around in the background. And I I like to be there for that crowd as well. Well, uh, you know, you basically defined me and my lifestyle right there. And I am definitely no youngster. I'm no hipster. (laughs) 
But I do live the suburban lifestyle. I'm like, you know, maybe maybe having this hinderer in my pocket's going to pay off today. You know, maybe there's a Ouch. car door I'm going to have to, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah, didn't mean yeah. that as a diss. You know yeah. what I mean. That's all right. I love Rick. He's a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah you know you 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 put these things in your pocket you spend a lot of time you know uh wringing your hands over which one to get and then you make a deliberate action and choose it you buy it and then you have it always and uh that's uh that's what that's what a medford knife is i mean you're very clear about that on your website buy one and if you're crazy i guess buy two if you're a collector but buy one and you'll be handing it down and down and down through the family you know, what's really funny is when the, the initial intellectual leap that's required to buy a $500 pocket knife or an $800 pocket knife for $1,200, that initial leap is usually a bit of a jump. But there's a lot of guys who've bought $4,000 Swiss watches. So there's a lot of people mm. to do it. Here's what's interesting. Once they do it, like I don't know if you actually own one of my knives. Have you ever actually held one of my knives that I've made? No, I have not. Okay, interesting. So once guys have made that leap, it's if it speaks to you, it's really hard to go back and and it's really hard to not have six of them. What I find we I think we average eight. Your average person who buys a Medford will buy seven more. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, what uh, that's obviously that's the ultimate compliment. Yeah, I love that. I I have two of your knives on my well, one knife is on my short list. The other is a little bit further down. But I, I'd love to get a Praetorian, just like a big old chunker Praetorian. And I would love to get, I love the en belay. Something about that is just, mm, so nice. Yeah, that was a fluke knife. That was the fluke, that was the fluke design of last year. I drew that knife. Uh, I drew three knives that day. That was one of the knives. And it was my least favorite of the three until it was done. And I put it in my hand. And then I went, oh, wow, I really like this knife. And then, cause I didn't want to make another gigantic knife. And then all of a sudden it took off and everybody wanted them. And I went, oh, Jesus, you know, what the hell do I know? I'll just make some more knives over here. And, and also your fixed blade knives, I mean, while, while we're talking about them, deserve mention because, uh, to me, I mean, the, the, the USMC fighter is so cool looking. And, and then also the, the, uh, knife, I can't remember what you call it, but the, the combo ground knife that breaks down completely with the oh, one yeah, knife so, on the hilt. Yeah. That- that's the USMC uh, Raider and the uh, – oh, wait a minute. You're talking about – yeah, uh, that's the USMC Raider and the Too Big to Fail. Too Big to Fail. That's what it was. Yeah. Those, yeah, yeah. I mean, those are those are just – oh, they're gorgeous. I love the way those blades look. I got to tell you about that knife. So uh, I stopped making the knife because I thought it was a character. It's too much. It's ridiculous. And I made a smaller version of it. Now, here's what's going on in my head. I said, eh. You know, I don't know these guys in Hollywood, but if one of them called me up and said, you know, if, if Sly called me and said, hey, Greg, I need you to make me a knife for the next movie. I'm going to finally do Last Blood. Would you make me a knife for what he said, Greg? Uh, I said, I'm going to make that knife. And I made the USMC Raider, which is the small version of that big, too big to fail uh, uh, TBF breakdown fighter. Here's what's fascinating. As soon as I said I was going to stop making the big knife, those sold out all around the world. And then everybody leaned on me to make another batch. So I made another batch and they all sold out. And I was like, what the hell are everyone doing buying this? And it's an expensive knife, right? <laughs> so yeah. this past weekend, we sold like three of them, which like off our website, which is crazy to me. It's the most obscure knife. You know, no one's carrying that knife around. So, you know, we sell stuff all the time. I sold three of those on Saturday. As I scratch my head, you never know what the market's going to fall in love with. Wow. It's so, uh, when, when that happens, I mean, like, you have to have that knife on hand. Uh, how does that no. work with, I mean, yeah, no? No, no. So what, what we do is I make knives at certain times of the year, and that's planned out in October of the preceding year. So hmm. I said, I'm going to make 20 of those or 50 of those or whatever it's going to be, or 250 of this model. And then those are available all year long. We sell them, but they're being made in November, for instance, or they're being made in February and November. So depending upon where you are in the order process is okay. what time of year you'll get your knife. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm remembering actually on your website, there's a, there's a little uh, bit of text on each page saying, you know, patience is a virtue. You yeah. might have to wait a little bit for this knife, but it's worth waiting for. Yeah. I always tell people, I'd rather have you pissed off at me for a few months and love me for the rest of your life than the reverse, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, the kids showing any interest in, in knives? 
Uh, my boy's into robotics, so if it turns into a big company and we end up doing production, my boy will probably, my guess is he'll be an engineer and do robotic development. My daughter is a concert pianist, and she is an orchestrator and an organizer, so I could see her being in some capacity, but I'm not really a legacy business guy. I feel like they need gotcha. to cut their own way in the world and find their own passion, you know? Yep, I, I would agree. Uh, one last thing. You have a, a funny yeah. or interesting knife story. I have two, and they're just kind of, they're not scary or harrowing. <laughs> uh, they're just kind of funny. It's a small world. So I have knives occasionally get stolen from customers and get lost from customers. And they'll call me up really dejected. And so far, with 100% capability, we have returned every missing knife to customers who've had them stolen. Uh, uh, so I had a good friend of mine who's Mormon, his knife went missing and it was a gift from me. And he told me about it and he said, Oh, I, I, I stopped by his workplace, said, Hey, where's your knife? And he said, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I <laughs> lost it months ago and I haven't, I haven't even called you cause I didn't want to tell you. And I said, you lost that knife. That was like the number one Praetorian G I ever made. He said, yeah, I'm so sorry. I said, it'll turn up. Don't worry. It's Mark number one. So three months later, giant guy walks in the front of the factory. Huge guy. Uh, I got this knife here. Uh, I was wondering, could you tell me anything about it? And I he puts the knife in my hand and it says number one on it. And I go, yeah, gotta be kidding me. I, and so I said, hey, man. I go, this actually belongs to a friend of mine. Uh, he said, I said, where'd you get it? He goes, well, I found it in a chair. And I go, really? I go, where'd you find it? And he says, I, you know, I, I'm a bouncer at a strip club. So uh, I was cleaning out the chairs and I found it in the chair at the strip club. Oh, oh my so it was, it was spectacular. So my friend, who's a little pious, uh, uh, I got to return tonight. I was like, hey. Guess, guess, I guess what? He said, I said, your knife has come back. He says, oh, my God, I'm so excited. I said, I'm going to come down to your business. I'll drop it off. So I go down to his business. He says, oh, I'm so excited. And he got a few people out. He says, look, Greg got my knife back. Greg, where did you find it? I said, well, it was a wedge in a chair at a gentleman's club, if you know what I mean. And there was this big gulp <laughs> moment. It was fantastic. It was so much fun for me. Yeah. I, I had a guy. Uh, who wiped out on his motorcycle recently. And he said he was going way too fast. He wiped out his bike and he had his Praetorian in his right hip pocket and he bit it. And as he was sliding on the ground and he could feel the fabric wearing through and the tarmac was starting to dig into his flesh, he had rotated and gotten up on the clip of his knife. And it was the one spot on the right side of his body between his boots and his shoulder of his jacket with padding on it that he could slide down the road and not get damaged. Mm. And so he sent his wow. knife in so that I would clean it up. And he said, but don't replace the clip. I, I always want those scratches there because I think your knife saved my bacon. So I've had a bunch of little cool things like that happen, which is great fun. That is, and and it's uh, just a really cool little uh, twist to the story that your knife saved this guy's life, but in a very unexpected way, like uh, yeah. just like the bullet yeah. you mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, crazy. You're just like, oh, so did you stab somebody with a knife? Oh, no, man, I used it as a skid plate, you know. But you know, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 there were sparks coming off, and it was titanium. It was awesome, and I'm like, oh my god, you know. I'm like, tell me you stabbed the bad guy because he jammed you up as you were breaching a room. No, no, he's, it's, not, you know, not quite, uh, it, uh, I got shot in the knife. That's how I'm, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> I got shot in the knife. Yep. Greg Medford, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Hey, pre appreciate you having me. And listen, man, uh, get out of the Beltway, come out to the Blade Show, visit me there. I'm always, I always have a prominent booth there. Come out and say hi and introduce yourself so we can put the humanity to the, uh, to the intellect. I, I most definitely will. That's that's the plan this coming year. Awesome. All righty, sir. Take care. Yep. Thanks for everybody for listening. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Back on the Knife Junkie podcast, Jim Person with Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Bob, uh, just another interesting interview this week. And uh, one thing that uh, kind of struck me was just the 
all in approach, I guess. Yeah. When I when I heard Greg talk about uh, you know how he got into making knives, it wasn't like, well, I'll I'll start with a you know a little grinder in the garage. I mean, like he was all in, yeah. man. Yeah. Well, um, uh, coincidentally, the the term uh, the old flying term balls to the wall came to came to my mind. It, was, it came from bomber pilots in World War II, and the throttle was all the way up. Uh, the balls on the top of the throttle are all the way to the front wall of the plane, and that and that seems to be the kind of guy Greg Med- Medford is. He's got this bold entrepreneurial spirit uh, backed by the bold spirit that was uh, maybe trained into him in the Marine Corps and then the sort of steel nerves it takes to do uh, aerobatic uh, flying. So, uh, yeah, he's like, well, if I can do all that stuff, I'm going to start a knife company. Boom. The next day he goes out, right. <laughs> buys a building. And starts and, one. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's inspirational. You know, it's, it's direct reaching out for what you want. So that means tomorrow you'll have a knife company? Uh, no, but I might, I might be closer to the thing I'm going to do. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, one thing that he said, uh, that, that just reeked of wisdom, uh, was, uh, a knife is a talisman of confidence. I was like, you know, that is a cool way to look at it. That is a, and it's a very, uh, clear way of looking at it. You know, he's not so much into the collecting aspect of it. Not that he would scoff at that, but, but it's not about collecting them necessarily. And it's definitely not about fidgeting with them. You heard mm-hmm. Greg's uh, ideas of what fidgeting means and what, you know, how it reveals character. It's about confidence in your pocket and in your hand and knowing that with a, with a stout and sturdy tool, like a basic knife like that, not calling his knives basic, of course, but you can confidently move forward in the world knowing that you can handle many different things. Anything else that really stuck with you? Kind of key takeaway thoughts from the the Greg Medford of Greg Medford Knives interview that you want to uh, leave us with on this on this podcast? Well, it's interesting because in speaking with him, I found that I really, you know, had a lot of respect for him. And in 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 hearing about how he came up with the designs, well, less about how he came up with the designs, but how he got to perfect his craft and how he started bringing other people in to to reproduce his his craft and build his company that way. So just, you know, really another pretty cool interview this week, a guy that's uh, making making custom knives and uh, has this business. And, you know, I think for you, Bob, at least I'm interpreting here, I think that's a a fun part for you is to really dive in and to hear these stories of how folks are getting into making knives and kind of see their progression and kind of kind of what they made made from it. So it's kind of kind of cool, too, for me hearing that as well. Yeah, it's it's hard not to draw parallels to your own lives when you when you listen to people you admire talking about their success stories and you look at at what you're trying to do in your own life and and try and draw the parallels. It can be very uh inspirational and it can it can really uh be commiserative. Well, and if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share on this interview, you liked it, you didn't like it, key takeaways that you really found interesting, love to hear from you. Call the listener line at 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. Leave us a message on that listener line, and we'd love to play back your thoughts on an upcoming podcast. Uh, either it could be about the Greg Medford interview or anything else about the Knife Chunky podcast. We would love to hear from you. For Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. I want to thank you for joining us on episode number 46 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. We'll be back with you again next week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 